Es pārstāvu medicīnas fakultāti un arī universitātes klīniskās un profilaktiskās medicīnas institūtu. Un tā kā mums šo gada konference ir startautiska konference, es pāriešu uz angļu valodu. Good morning, everybody. This is my great pleasure to welcome you all here. We still do have a few empty seats, but I'm quite sure they will be filled in in a minute. We are really happy to welcome already the second uh, international medical conference organized by the University of Latvia. Of course, uh, Faculty of Medicine is leading the conference, but not only. There are other faculties, other specialities that are involved in organizing the conference. And although we have had international sections in the conference already during few recent years, although this is a second international conference as such already in the university in the medical field, this year we are more than happy to welcome indeed brilliant scientists from the top centers in Europe, from our neighboring countries and also from the countries to the east, including countries in the Central Asian part, in the Central uh, European part, geographical Central European part to this conference. And we are really looking forward to see presentations and data from these countries. And we encourage really to exchange the knowledge and to gain out of the results of this conference. And without further ado, this is my great pleasure to uh, ask our rector, Professor Indritis Mojnieks, to open the conference and to greet the members. Labrīt, cienāmē konferences dalībnieki, viesi, Skatos turēs durvīm vēl ir diezgan liela rinda, un atsiem redzot augstais laiks vēl ir iesaltējis dažas riteņas, kas vēl ir ceļā, bet es esmu ļoti priecīgs redzēt šeit tik pilnu zāli, un priecīgs arī, ka šī mūsu 76. jau startautiskā zinātniskā konferences ir pulcējusi tik daudz un promenēts cilvēks gan no Latvijas, gan Latvijas no ārzemēm, gan arī mūsu jaunos kolēģis, kas šajā konferencē noteikti smelsies iedvesumu saviem tālākajiem darbiem. Good morning, all the participants of the 76 International Research Conference of the University of Latvia. We are very proud that this conference has gained really international spin in the year when our country is celebrating its 100 years anniversary. And uh, we are looking forward to the 100 years anniversary of the university next year, which of course will be celebrated by even more uh, significant research and academic events. But uh, all today what we see that there's a huge line of uh, still participants waiting to join the session. And here we can see the representatives of the most prominent research institutions in Latvia, of the leading uh, hospitals of Latvia, and also uh, young students and uh, starting uh, researchers from the university. And not what is especially important in this case, that uh, here we see not only the students of medicine, but also students of pharmacy, students of biology, students of chemistry. That's what is the uh, advantage of the studies of medicine at the university, where you can combine all the possible sorts of knowledge to uh, obtain uh, this synergy of uh, researchers uh, to, to foster the new uh, approaches in medicine, in personalized medicine and precision medicine, which we see is the goal and the core of our developments and which is the priority of research and development of the university. Uh, we are trying to support this development by all means, especially by also uh, providing uh, needed infrastructure, by bringing together at this new campus all the 
research intensive disciplines of the university, which of course will be important for further success for the gaining more international attractiveness for this research. Uh, we are used, we are all frequently repeating the famous saying from uh, Professor Paul Stradinch that medicine is uh, amalgamation of uh, profession, uh, vocational skills, art and science. And although today we are emphasizing the part of science in medicine, I'm really glad that also the leading clinicians from our leading hospitals are here, and some of them, like Professor Eagles, who asked our leading cardiologist to ask to um, forward his best wishes to the conference uh, participants, is still working at the hospital and is uh, joining the conference in several hours, and the others who are now here will go to the clinics <laughs> during the path of the day, and this just shows how important is this um, interaction between research, between academic work and studies uh, in the, under the umbrella of university. So all the best for your today's work, uh, bright exchange of ideas, new ideas, possibly new projects, and welcome again after a year to our 100 years uh, anniversary and to our 77th research conference at the University of Latvia. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks to our rector, and indeed I was supposed to do the same, bring the greetings from Professor Andres Erglis <laughs> and, and, and excuse himself because he is really occupied in an urgent medical care situation. So now my pleasure is to give the floor to the Vice Dean of the uh, Faculty of Medicine, Gustav Slotkovskis. Good morning, uh, dear participants, uh, students, researchers, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, uh, Faculty of Medicine of the University of Latvia, let me express my uh, excitement that we see that our aim to develop this uh, regular uh, scientific conference as more international and more advanced and involving more and more students and other researchers, not only from uh, uh, Riga, Latvia, but also from other countries, has uh, been uh, fulfilled step by step, but we see that there's uh, uh, clearly a very good progress uh, made during these years. And I really hope that it is, and actually I, I, I could say that it is our very, we see it as very important task in our uh, faculty that our students are more and more involved in the research activities. This is why we are uh, re-scheduling uh, and reviewing uh, our study programs. We involve more and more research activities uh, in curricula at earlier stages. We involve, we include more statistical courses, et cetera, et cetera. We are trying as much as possible to get these also interdisciplinary links and international links developed among uh, not only within the field of medicine but with some other fields. So uh, I believe there's, uh, uh, we are going in the right direction, but there's still very much uh, uh, work to do. But, and I'm very glad to see that there are many medical students here. I'm glad also to see some other, uh, uh, many other uh, researchers and uh, students from other fields. And I would uh, especially would like to uh, uh, say many thanks to our international guests. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and I really hope that this is not only uh, uh, this year, but uh, in future years we have uh, even more international guests. And besides, that this is a good opportunity and platform to develop further collaboration and to, uh, to exchange such meetings uh, in future, uh, not only here, but in other countries. So I wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you. So indeed, the, the role of the Faculty of Medicine is very important in organizing this event, but now I'm more than happy to say that also the Ministry of Health has really appreciated the conference, and as uh, we, it is represented in the highest, uh, highest level, so that is my great pleasure to invite Ivor Slapinch, the State Secretary from the Ministry of Health.
labrīt, labrīt rektori, labrīt profesori, studenti, dāmas un kungi. Pa cik man ir Dieviņš Devis to iespēju ar iemācīties kaut ko anglisku pateikt, un es nojaušu, ka visi zālē sēdošie anglisku sapratīs, tad es atvainojos zālē sēdošo vismaz viena parlamentārieša priekšā, ka es šeit nelielu atkāpu no latviešu valodas likuma izdarīšu, un tiešām uzrunāšu jūs arī tad varbūt angliski. Dear guests, dear professors from all around the region, I am very honored to say a few words here. And uh, by agreeing to all what's been said before, uh, I'd like to highlight that uh, cardiovascular uh, is, is the subject uh, that I see in your program, uh, coming up program for today, as one of the subjects besides uh, oncology, besides uh, other uh, subjects and programs and priorities that are important for us as a state. I have to say that now we are uh, struggling with very interesting uh, challenges uh, that are, that are ahead of us that are very uh, topical these days that relate to the additional financing that's been done and given to uh, Latvian uh, health uh, care. And I, and I very often face, uh, therefore, uh, challenge to prove that how will this affect by using the most modern technologies, by using the most modern uh, technologies in, in all ways, um, not only by way of you know what equipment is available, but but what knowledge is available there, uh, so that we can cure uh, patients even better. And I really trust that this conference may deliver a lot to this. And I think international cooperation uh, is utmost importance and gives a, a, a great opportunities because we can always look behind our borders, what's happening there. We can always compare. Uh, I think it broadens our scope of, of, of thinking, and uh, I, I'm also sure that uh, many of you may find yourself, uh, yourselves, especially for the students, maybe in coming years, someplace else. I also trust that you will come back then at some point of time, and, and those international students who are he here can, can contribute to the knowledge, uh, to the, to the uh, science and research that is carried out here, but in a broader region. And, and then <coughs> coming back to your uh, home countries or, or elsewhere, uh, again, to contribute to fact-driven uh, health care. But what stands, of course, uh, before the health care is something that I read um, unintentionally. I, I drew my attention to page 115 in this uh, abstract uh, setup. That is the Nordic walking. It's quite cold outside today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure if I will be able to make it uh, by, by walking down to the ministry back now in a in, in, in few, uh, few hours to come. But, but I think, uh, again, it proves the link between not only uh, uh, cure and care and health care, but also in a broader sense of, of having uh, people taking care of their own health themselves. And I think that's also that is, that is very, very uh, fundamental. Uh, we often maybe focus ourselves too much on, on, on curing patients already when they become a patient. As I, as I have said to, to colleagues of mine and friends, let it be so that your data never appears in the e-health record. That means that you'll be always healthy. You will do your Nordic walking or your German walking or your Latvian walking. You will improve your cardiovascular uh, system Therefore, all of your other systems, you know better than me how it, how it uh, correlates, and there is even a scientific publication in that. Seven millimeters or whatever, and the scale, you know, that's the difference. So far, I read it. Uh, so thank you very much. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been really a pleasure to give you some of these opening words, and I, and I wish you all the best success uh, today and, and also in the future. So let this cooperation be... Uh, uh, permanent and uh, benefiting uh, all of the parties that are involved here at the professor level and uh, for students as well and as well as for mainly that's the target our patients and our populations our societies so let it be so and and all the all the best for you today paldies lielos un tiešām veiksim un šodien šajā konferencē un tālākajā sadarbībā arī ar saviem partneriem un starp arī Latvijas 
spēlētājiem šajā veselības aprūpes sistēmā un ves, rūpējas par veselību, lai izdodās. Thanks to the Secretary of State, thanks to the Ministry, and indeed we appreciate that Ministry is dealing not only with the complaints and bad things what we hear around, but also with good things and perspective in particular research as well. Thanks once more. And, and now we have a special speech. We have a keynote uh, lecture from Ramal Tsarajuks, the member of our parliament and the chairperson of the Public Health Committee. So the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, dear brothers in arms, in, in our fight for better financiation of our healthcare professors, students of uh, Latvian University, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to inform you about a revolutionary event in our healthcare finances. Uh, really not because, only because 210 million euros in addition to 800 million existing was provided. No, it's because uh, we passed in December uh, the healthcare financiation law, integral part of which is mandatory state health insurance, uh, process which is known in our neighbor countries, Estonia and Lithuania for decades. And uh, what we managed politically agree and achieve only now. As you know, in the beginning of uh, when we restored our independence, we were approximately at the same level in possible available finances and other resources in healthcare. But after that, you see Eurostat, you see World Health Organization, Latvia is in, in, in this green uh, color in, in the very lowest position. Our financiation was so poor that, uh, that actually situation with medical personnel, uh, with abilities of our citizens to get re decent medical aid was endangered. What should have been the healthcare expenditure in Latvia in 2017. Ministry calculated 1.3 billion necessary. In reality, it was close to 80, 800 million. And uh, the shortfall you see is, is uh, half a billion. Half a billion was the shortfall between calculated and really provided. Healthcare budget of Estonia in 2017 was 1 billion. 130 million. Health budget in Lithuania, 1.6 billion. If we imagine that we at least are at the level of Lithuania in our finances, so we need to, according to the number of citizens, because we have less people in Latvia than in Lithuania, uh, then our financiation should have been 1.1 billion. So the shortfall, we had to find at least 300 million euros. The opponents of introduction of this mandatory state health insurance say, yes, this is not good, you know, violation of uh, human rights, whatever. Let's announce healthcare a priority. What does it mean? Nothing. Nothing. You see, last year planning budget for so-called new initiatives, only 70 million euros were divided for police, education, culture, for everyone. But we need 300 million. Compare 70 and 300. That means that such money is not existing in the budget, even theoretically, it's not existing. What have we to do? Of course, answer is compulsory or mandatory state health insurance. It's universal fear and solidarity. 
Long, long ago, we started to talk about that. In 1988, at the first Congress of the Popular Front of Latvia, our one of leading uh, professors, medics of that time, Ilmas Lazovskis, um, told that given the good experience of the previous years, this should be considered insurance medicine, which Latvia called the sickness insurance system, which was before the war. Afterwards, several other politicians and medics tried to introduce it during the 11th time, previous, previous uh, term of the parliament, Minister Ingrid Atsirtsene tried to introduce that. Due to lack of understanding, resistance, she failed that at the cost of her political career, and uh, her political career was ruined. What's the matter? My understanding is, uh, like in, in this, you know, fable of La Fontaine, that everyone tried to do what he wanted. And in coalition governments, when every party has some ministry, all the time every party tries to show and to get resources to the ministry of itself. And that's why nothing was possible. Situation in the healthcare was going worse and worse. And of course, every bad thing has a silver lining. Prime Minister understood that we need urgent money, urgent money in, in our health care and understood that we will never find this mo uh, money in the budget. We need additional from a side from this mandatory state insurance. But she, he understood that at least 200 million uh, euros are necessary. And in December, we passed that law. What does it mean? Salary recipients who pay taxes in the normal, ordinary manner will feel no inconvenience. Accountant just count this one additional percent to the social tax, which is now going to uh, health care, and that will be the same. Those who get income some other way, they will have to insure themselves paying 1% of the minimum wage, that's euro, Fair, uh, four euros uh, 30 cents uh, in 2018 to get a whole, whole scope of healthcare services in 2019. Of course, there are uh, people who cannot pay, definitely. These are so called vacant categories who are free of payment children, pensioners, unemployed, handicapped, and so on and so on. 18 categories. How we put together this budget between those who are paying and those uh, who are insured by, by the states? You see, in Estonia, it's 48 and 48, and others uh, who are living not from the wage is 4%. So it's almost 50-50. In Lithuania, it's a little bit different. Injured from the state budget is 58% and payers are 42%. But at least it's half, we can say half and a half. Of course, a painful question is what range of services should be in each, in each basket. Basket, I think, for those payers of social tax who get all possible services and those who do not pay, who get urgent, uh, urgent help and some other services. Uh, usually, in, this is our idea of 2011, that this is urgent medical help, some diagnosis, infectious disease, um, uh, psychiatric disease, uh, birth help, and so this um, should be. Taking into account that we were very late in the introduction of this system, there are already traditions, people get used to some orders. Here you see the, uh, this drawing from the Ministry of, of Health, and in this uh, rose or a little bit blue, um, blue part, you see this, what is available for the uh, non-payers. So actually very many issues 
And in Latvia, plus family doctor, family practitioner, which is not the case in other countries, but taking into account that we were too late, we also provided for non-payers also possibility to get help from the family doctor. But this is the very beginning. In Estonia, 15% of social tax, 15% uh, from the brutal salary is uh, transferred to, to health care. In Lithuania, 9%. We have only 1%. But of course, in pre-election year and 20 years late, we were not able to, to, to do more, and that's why natural question, how we will go further in the future. What the government uh, more did more? Of course, it was not possible to wait until from 1% we will we'll reach more percent from the brutal salary, this uh, health care tax. On the cost of budget deficit, European Commission allowed us to borrow money from ourselves. In 2018, these are 110 million euros, and in 2019, 140 millions. These 80 millions, as you see, these are, uh, we get it from this 1% we, we, we accepted in, uh, in December at the law of mandatory insurance. So, in, but in 2020, we'll, we'll have this 1%, 80 million, but there will be no additional money on the cost of budget deficit. Such permission we didn't get from European Commission, and then we'll have to put something instead. And solution, of course, is mandatory state insurance, and the uh, solution is to increase this percent. To increase this percent, mainly, I think, on the macroeconomical level, transferring from the income tax some percent to the social tax. Again, those who oppose this system should look at this table. 16 European countries have mandatory state insurance. 16. And 11 of them are post-socialistic countries with weak budgets. So this is the place we can get, where we can get this additional <laughs> money for the health care. And my strong belief is that decent, modern medical health care system is alive and can provide the social type health care available to everyone. Only then it's standing on three rails. Compulsory state health insurance, budget grants, and voluntary health insurance in private companies. Free Wales. So that's, that's what I wanted to tell. We are coming back to, to 1990 when we were on the same level. And here, what's my fear? That when the money comes to our health care, maybe our health care <coughs> is so poor, in, in such a bad shape, that uh, this money cannot be used anymore for the sake of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed for these very important aspects and we are not going to raise any questions for the state of art questions or for the opening session, but without further ado, this is my great pleasure to invite then the next uh, chairperson of the <coughs> plenary session and uh, also in addition to Professor Lotkovskis, I'm, I'm, this, I'm honored to, to have also Jan Borchain chairing the session together. Uh, with us, and I'm giving the, the floor for opening the session to Professor Lutkowski. So good morning uh, once again, and since we are running already behind the schedule slightly, we, without further hesitation, I would like to uh, present to you the first speaker who is an absolutely well-known guru in the genetics and biomedicine, and, uh, 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 and, and the topic that he'll be talking about will be from biobanking to precision medicine and Estonian example. And I'm very pleasured and honored to give a floor to Professor Andres Metzpalu from uh, Tartu, uh, University of Tartu, Estonia. Thank you for coming over here. 
all this, la breed. But now I'm switching to English. So thank you very much for inviting me. And you know, uh, I'm coming from Tartu, old Livland, and Riga used to be our capital. But uh, now 100 years from tomorrow, uh, we uh, really have uh, two countries, but we used to have one. So uh, 20 years ago, we got a vision that, uh, because I'm MD and did uh, genomic genetics, uh, and so we had a vision 20 years ago that we should really use the genetics in, uh, in more widely than just Mendelian disorders like we, we did before. And uh, we had uh, in mind that we have to use it in pharmacogenomics, in complex disease. And, but in order to do this, you have to understand your population um, genetic variants. Because also in Europe we are more or less the same, but I assure you still we have a little differences. And this is important. You know, one base can change your life. So we started the Stern and Biobank year uh, 2000, we got a law. But uh, before law you have to work already uh, quite uh, intensively in order to get all these politicians on your uh, thinking like you want them to think. So uh, first of all, we recruited like um, took some time and money, and so we government didn't give, uh, government gave us sixty-four thousand euros and please do a buyback. But we went to U.S. and found money. But after ten thousand people, the U.S. money was running out, so we went back to the government account. Oh, now you have already set everything up, up and running. So they donated us money. And now this year again, they gave five million in order to increase the buyback from fifty thousand to hundred fifty thousand, which means. 15% of population will be genotyped by, um, by Christmas. So, and we have also by banking law. I tell you, law is very important, otherwise governments are going, governments are coming, but if you have a law, you know, they have to think about the law. So laws are still important. So about population, so you see here, so um, we, uh, we did a European survey because at the beginning, Nobody was thinking, says, you know, small country far away, you know, in the corner of EU, who cares? But basically, look, uh, we are in Europe um, here with, with you. Latins are closest genetically to us. And, look, and also you see uh, Lithuania, Poland, North, Western Russians. And, but Finns are here. Kusamo, which is isolated in North of Finland, is here. Swedes are here, and then the rest of Europe and South Italy and um, you know Calabria. So basically, we are all here, and the Estonians are here. So basically, uh, we we have um, we are the same, but we are still different. So you have to understand your uh, genomic variants in your population in order to implement genomic medicine, because rare variants are also important. So after you know recruitment, we got a pyramid like this. We have a more women, a little bit less men, but all age groups are covered. And uh, and the only difference from because it was voluntary program, we uh, we had uh, only thing what was different from the real population was that the people who joined the biobank, in average, were in school one year more. Otherwise, same. So what people think about it. You know, it's different in different countries, Europe. Here you see, this shows how much support do we have. About, you know, 67, 70%. And it goes a little bit, uh, you know, according to how much news there are on TV. Um, only, only media they are following uh, is TV. Newspapers are too expensive to subscribe, so TV. If you are TV, you know, people know more. If you are not, then you don't know. But these are who are against of this and, you know, and these ones want to know more, and these are ones who never heard about the Biobank. We have been in media probably a thousand times, but still close to 30% of telling that I never heard. So there are people who are not participating in public life in a way, and it's not like Russian speakers. We have 26% of Russian speakers, but uh, it's not only them. So there are lots of um, others also. So in Estonia, we have uh, e-health already for a while, and that means everybody has an um, ID number, and also data in, um, in um, electronically available. So we have electronic medical records and everything. So basically, this allows us to do it also countrywide. So it allows us to get all the data on these 52,000 people we have. Uh, we can draw the disease or life trajectory from birth to death. And you look, you know, 
like health insurance bills or uh, text records, we can read even uh, free text, but clinical lab measurements. You see, see here is the one like uh, C-reactive protein. Looks like pretty messy, but if you just apply uh, some filtering on the data, you see that there's a peak here, and then you go to the record and see actually the person was hospitalized, was uh, inflammation, and so it all real data. So like take like this one, there's uh, somebody from the biobank, and here is a moment of recruitment. So we have also the pre-existing data, and then what happened after, and all these are ICD-10 codes here. So these are the good way to, to stratify the people, to analyze, and if you have large numbers, then what happens in childhood can actually uh, reflect it also what happens here. And so it's important to know the full thing. So of course, then we have to do lots of omics. You have to understand the variants. So we sequenced um, deeply 3,000 people um, from the biobank and uh, about 2,500 exomes. Exome sequencing is now last five years as a diagnostic tool in the country, but uh, you know, it's going on in hospital now. We started in biobank and genome center, but now it's all transferred to the hospital. Hospitals are running a race for certain things and sequencing exomes <laughs> for certain things. But do we, we chat up everybody in the biobank and you know, did lots of other things, including, for instance, metabolomics and uh, nuclear mag magnetic resonance data um, of 11,000 people. And now we are going to do them all. So now the thing is how to, I'm not talking about Mendelian diseases, incidental findings or chiral screening or anything. I'm now co talking about common complex disease. And you know, uh, and just few slides how we are doing it. You know, there are lots of things going on on the genomics called GWAS studies, you know, genome-wide association studies, and you get lots of loci, and, um, but, uh, but uh, this is only the, the tip of the iceberg. So we published a uh, method how to use, how to generate um, genetic risk scores using um, uh, using um, uh, polygenic risk scores. And, uh, and I just want to show that you have to have your own reference panel in order to impute because you can't, uh, you do array which is very cheap. Arrays cost now 25 euros and uh, a good arrays. And you can actually, and there are probably 700,000 markers, but if you have a good reference panel, at least you sequence like a couple of thousand or probably a couple probably enough, not enough probably, 10,000 people from Latvia, then you can impute this array to almost full, um, um, full sequence uh, with minor relative frequency, even 0.05 or even less. So uh, our aim is just to go down 0.01%. So you get almost uh, down to the common uh, Mendelian uh, carrier frequencies. So, and, and if you just go to like, uh, minor relative frequency is 0.5 to 5, you know, this condens rate is other, most commonly I use the imputation is 1,000 G, and you need the population-based uh, data are much better. So in order to do medicine, you have to get the best uh, thing. Like, um, uh, like Mr. Saint, you know, basically you need the best technology. Because if you start today with best technology, 10 years later or five years later, it's not already the best, it's uh, the thing of yesterday. So a few examples now of genomics. Of course, we know lots of time already that are important alleles, uh, cytochrome P50, uh, uh, 450 um, uh, alleles, and, uh, but very little is used in hospital. And, uh, and we, seek, we took the data from these 2,400 uh, participants and we looked very, uh, in very detailed ways. We found 41 loss of function single nucleate variants, about 600 non synonymous and 20% and of this was novel, so never seen before, and uh, about, uh, you know, lots of rare variants. So basically, each individual had actually at least one loss of um, uh, functional allele, that means complete null, uh, this gene is not functional, and uh, 38 non synonymous CNVs, which, change, uh, um, which is not changing, but it's still coding. Now what do we see? 
because we have these databases and we see, uh, we know we have prescription database also, we can see what people, what diagnosis they had, what prescription drugs they bought. We don't know whether they really took it, but if you see that they are buying all the time, so we don't think that they are spending time and money just to throw them away. And you take these 26 loss of function mutations and look at those reactions. And you know, all of a sudden, you know, they started that nicely with, let's say, drug two. And, uh, and then, you know, doctor got the idea, let's try the number four also here, which is tamoxifen. And then you end up in hospital with uh, generalized skin eruption to the drugs and medicaments taken internally. So, but luckily they change switch back to the old drug and it goes on fine. So here, the same thing, they started with wrong food, would say, and, uh, and immediately you develop a, a myositis because this is uh, starting. And then you change the drug and you go normal. But this information should be already available at the moment doctors prescribing the drug. And the uh, and final barrier would be in the pharmacy and you go and show your ID card and so look, there's a red flag. You can't really take this one. Why don't you go back to your doctor and get a new one? But here we get uh, into the problem, um, you know, uh, always is uh, we have to use uh, evidence-based medicine. So now you have a one, N is one. There's no way you can do a double-blinded, uh, randomized clinical trial. You just have one patient. And we see it also exome sequencing. You have this poor kid, you see definitely there's a you know, strong phenotype, you sequence the whole thing, you find a variant, and you go to the databases, and no one has found this before. So what you're gonna do? How do you prove that this variant is actually the causative variant? It's not easy. So you go to the, to the also research, but in some cases, you just even do research. You take the gene, you, you change it back to the normal. You see that, of course, in model, uh, model organisms, that, okay, you change the phenotype, you risk the phenotype. But then you go to the physician and, and tell, look, we did this thing in, in C. elegans or mouse. Do you really think that my baby has something similar to your C. elegans or this mice? No, I don't believe you. So actually, this is a uh, problem we have here that um, just we have to get more into functional assays. But uh, luckily, uh, you know, more and more people are sequencing. More and more we get these variants into the databases. And in, in our case, like a couple of months later, somebody in Arizona published the same variant, same phenotype. And so we really mm, felt good. And, um, and you know, there's very often there is a treatment available if you know the cause of the disease, even in these rare Mendelian disorders. So what we are now producing is an automatic um, uh, report on people based on um, genomic data. Pharmacogenetic feedback, unfortunately this is Estonian, but uh, but it tells you if it's um, if there is a green plus, that means you know nothing. You, and these are the genes we are checking actually, because you know if you just go into detail, uh, it's not so easy to do it. Even if you sequence, you know there are star alleles, there are copy number variants. It's not so just just sequence. You get all the information. So you have to do a few extra tests, and um, and it in a way it makes it a little bit longer and so we have to think how to solve the problem. For instance, one important gene we can't do by sequencing is 2D6. You have to run some um, um, TACPAN assays, at least two. And, uh, but you know, this is what, the, here it's all uh, automatically produced and genetic counselor or, or GP or whoever gets it. And um, for instance, here there is, a, you have to use um, lower dose. Here, you have to keep in mind, but you're still, because uh, it's uh, average uh, metabolic rate for this um, uh, drug, but the rest are normal. But you know, not all, but we know average that almost every second person metabolize one of these drugs differently because of these genetic variants. And um, now go on, like type two diabetes. Very bad disease, very pretty common, very expensive. And, um, and here we published a method how we are doing this genetic polu polygenic risk scores. And basically, it's lots of variants. We are, we are not using only the variants which are coming out from GIVA studies, 
but uh, since we have um, prevalent cases and um, incident cases, so when I recruited people, they had already disease. And now after following them up for 10 years, we have uh, um, people who didn't have disease, but have it now. And now we are working out the algorithms based on prevalent cases and testing it on incident cases. How well we are predicting the cases which are happening, we know, but we just uh, see, can, could we use uh, the software and pick them up? And it picks up quite well. So what we are, you see, this is the normal distribution of some uh, genetic risk scores for coronary artery disease in our population for seven and a half thousand people. So we are after this corner here, the red ones, the high risk people. And now, type to diabetes, you see how important this um, is um, uh, body mass index. This is important. So if you just have a low genetic risk, but high BMI, and you have a high GRS and high BMI, or you have high GRS and low BMI, so look, we can compare these two uh, columns here. And so genetics as important uh, feature, I guess, as, uh, um, but, um, but the lifestyle factor is here is even more important. So what we are telling the people that, um, so if you, if you have, um, you are here now, 36, 46, sorry, and um, now what happens? If you, and we just give them scenario, if you keep your, if you keep your um, uh, weight, like it should be, like BMI 25 or so, then you end up here, your risk is uh, less than 5%. But if you go up here, like, like me, then your risk is five times higher, six times higher. So, and if you are here, you, this is what you can do. You can go this way, not this way. But I tell you, from here, down here, is probably 100 times more difficult than from here to here. Just to lose weight, damn difficult. But, uh, but you know, even to add weight, this is also a genetic background. It's not uh, the appetite, it's genetic. Everything's genetic, but if you have a, you know, it's not enough if you have this information. We need a new profession. We need a kind of a, um, a f nurse who gives you a phone call, basically. Yes, there are publications that even if computer calls you, I send the SMS and you, you have to do this and have you, you know, taking drugs or whatever, it already improves the thing. But, but you know, people are lazy, you know, and New Year's Eve, you know, everybody promised to do something and be a better person and, you know, uh, run more and eat less and whatever. Now the Easter holidays are coming, you know, uh, all forgotten. But if, you, but if you get a phone call, look, and you have this damn fridge, uh, the phone or something telling to somebody, this nurse, Health coach, I would say, is her name or his name. And you know, you missed your training. And so you get hungry. Are you serious about type 2 diabetes? You know, you, you missed your training last week. And you just feel that, look, I still have to go, regardless of weather or mother in law in sitting in the living room. So, take next is coronary artery disease. Again, uh, you see how much uh, high risk. Uh, uh, people are different from low genetic risk. So this is important, again, to identify high-risk people from your population and direct the uh, limited money everywhere's money is tight. To this group who have high risk, you get much better return. In this 1.1 billion euros, uh, only 1% goes for prevention of disease. M most goes just to treat the disease because hospitals are paid per patient. They are absolutely not interested to get less, uh, you know, patients. If, if, if you're running a sawmill and you're getting paid per how much timber comes in, they are not interested in the less timber because everybody's losing. So we have to change the reimbursement system. Not paying for patients, but being healthy. And there are some examples in the world. 
So now what to do with carp? Of course you can get a statins, but look how important is smoking, especially in men. Also women are smoking nowadays even more than men, but uh, you definitely put your uh, life into jeopardy if you are smoking and you have a high genetic risk. This is one strong recommendation. And I tell you, we have been doing it for about 400 people got this type of response because we do it as a scientific project now. And uh, now it's already started also in hospital, but we learned what people are, uh, how people are reacting it. And so ethicists are saying, oh, you can't tell it, they go and jump from the bridge. No, no. They are interested, they are happy, and, and they are actually believing. And this is a strong argument for them to st stop smoking because nobody wants to be killed uh, again. You need, it's not only information, you have to have a kind of a supporting system. It takes five years to change your lifestyle. Probably some people can stop smoking one morning, but, uh, but not everybody is so strong. So let's take next disease, which is familiar hypercholesterolemia. Quite, um, it's, um, it's um, again, bad disease. Not so uh, rare, out, one out of 200 has. And you see, uh, only, if you take only these three genes, so you see how much actually the uh, genetic influence uh, the disease. And what we did in Estonia, we just took, uh, we sequenced uh, together these exomes about 4,700. Uh, 4, we uh, took these three genes, took some, loss of function mutations and invited them back to cardiology hospital. So they went through extensive cardiology um, checkup, genetic counseling, and then we united also the family members and so on, did a cascade. So what actually came up? Let's take before study. We had lots of people, absolutely no diagnosis. Then we had a um, group of people who is diagnosed like hyperlipidemia. You know, doctors saying, look, um, yeah, eat less, run more. And then we had only three people uh, with FH diagnosis. After study, we had uh, most got the new diagnosis, new treatment, which is statin. And I tell you, lots of these people never see the emergency uh, medical unit, can live uh, and die from cancer or something like that. So now our treatment has changed. There's lots of people who had uh, 60, almost 70% had absolutely no treatment from this group. And, uh, and uh, moderate, 22% moderate intensity statin, and uh, only 10% got really high. This was uh, FH patients. Now, when we went through the hospital, so basically high in intensity statins here, moderate statins here, and uh, no treatment for 14%. And 20% um, declined. But this, you know, this is, they, they declined uh, because somebody was uh, pregnant, somebody was breastfeeding, and you know, all, all real reasons. So they were not, and, and from these ones, first they declined because there is a lot of rumors. You know, we have anti, anti vaccine people, we have anti statin people, we have. All people, people, life is good, you know, you are now time to be against of everything, not for. And uh, so basically, gradually these people also came back later and really uh, started to take a study. So what I want to tell you is that we can implement the method which is genetics first, because this is the most cheaper thing nowadays. You have to establish a biobank, but then everything is cheap. And uh, genotype everybody. Oh, at least half of it, because the rest you can impute. Everybody's somebody's son, brother, mother, father, whatever. So this is, uh, uh, to us, it looks like this is a way to implement such end medicine. Or breast cancer, again. Now, I'm running out also time, but um, what we did, again, the same thing. We took um, all the genotype people, and we uh, used here, we just didn't use a BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, mutations here but just uh, snips from the genome and used more than 100,000 snips. And, and because we know who had that disease and who didn't, and then you see high risk, the so top 5% and takes here, if you are, you get 70 years old and you have 5% probability to get breast cancer. This is population-based data now. But if you have high genetic risk, the same thing happens when you are 50 years old. 
That means for this group, we have to do this prevention, you know, whether MRI or, or mammography, which is, I know, some of you is useless, but anyway, people um, can do something 15 years earlier. Last year, Estonia had a, uh, we had 800 new breast cancer cases. We definitely could avoid quite a number of them if we could go and, uh, and you know, it's 5%. Uh, if I go for 10%, it's just uh, five years uh, later, but still important. So we could do something. And now oncologists are telling, low genetics is important, only BRCA1 or BRCA2, you know, because we have these sporadic cases and nobody knows how they're doing. Of course, we don't know. It took 100 years before we understood why, why aspirin helps us or, or prostaglandins. They are already around for a while, then finally they figured out and got the price. So basically, I would say that um, now if you am, uh, uh, use a big data, basically, and so full genome information, you don't even know what all these SNPs are doing, but you can show that they are participating because everybody has his own disease. You have a uh, hundred different ways to get breast cancer or a hundred different ways to get uh, hypertension or type 2 diabetes. But, but if you know the data, you can predict who is more likely to get it because genetics is not telling that you will get it. But, uh, but if you have a limited amount of money, then you have to use it more wisely. And this is, I believe, a way to implement genetics in, in real medicine. So what we see is that, of course, we have a, everything has to be automated. The automated decision support system. So there is no time that um, GP is going to order some test. It just opens a lead here and trees. Oh, you have 10 times higher, or let's say five times higher glaucoma risk. Go to eye doctor. Eye doctors know if you have a high genetic risk, what to do. They measure your eyeball pressure. Probably once per year or once per five years, depends on what you age. But say you never lose sight. You have eye drops when your pressure is high. But now we, uh, we don't see them before they already, one eye is, is gone. So it, it's like circle. You, in real medicine, what you are doing, everything is recorded, and you follow it from helicopter, basically. And, and you improve the database. You use the new data to uh, prescribe more precisely the drugs. You can use the data to invite, uh, you know, if you have, a, I demonstrated, if you have one case proband, you can get the whole family already involved. And in a way, you, at the end of the day, you probably know from the entire population who are under risk of certain disease. And, and then you match, and this is much cheaper than to the brain surgery or uh, liver transplantation. So I would say the large prospective barbar cohorts make possible to move towards personalized medicine and um, in general practice. However, it's not the easy road. There's lots of people who have to uh, get out from comfortable zone and change mind, change work, change job, and uh, but patients will uh, be happy at the end of the day. They are not suffering uh, 10 years or more because of uh, type 2 diabetes or some other chronic disease. So, well, yes. <laughs> Thank you indeed for this exciting lecture and actually we are behind the time but nevertheless I think we could have a couple of very fast questions and I'm always excited to see the, one of the first slides that you were showing in the very beginning and my question there is that you were demonstrating that Estonians are more, more closer to Latvians even not to Finnish people. So how you explain really the language similarities then? Uh, you know, <coughs> genes and language are not going together. I don't know what did you learn on this language. <laughs> but genetically, we are very close. Thank uh, you. You are the real closest uh, brothers and sisters to us. We appreciate Finns are far away. Because we have, a, we have a sea between us. And it's, old times it was even frozen, but nowadays it... Uh, it doesn't freeze anymore. So. Sure, and we join in your celebration for tomorrow. Thank you. But other other quick questions, if no.
just south, I hear. Yeah. So, quite frequently, we find some uh, genetic variations of non uh, unknown uh, uh, significance. So, how you deal with this? Uh, do you look for the functionality of them? Do you do in silico plus uh, some other studies? Or you also sometimes use in your calculations those who are variants where you predict they would be functionally important? Yeah, now it's just two things. In hospitals, they just turn telosis. If it's unknown, you have no time to do anything. You just have enough uh, patients with so known variants. Mm -hmm. But, uh, in, of course, in a research institute, the GM Center, we have to we are sometimes you know, taking extra mile and trying to figure out, and so functional studies are of course one thing, but um, it's not easy. And uh, basically, uh, I guess the best way is so many things to do, just sit and wait and, and see what happens uh, on the database. And we have to uh, sequence more, and then the variants are you know, coming out, because now there's a big project in Europe, uh, they wanna sequence one million at the beginning, at least. There's uh, every country sequencing, uh, say, patients in France, they started a big project in Paris and Lyon, and they're putting like the hundreds of millions into the sequencing. So data are coming, and I guess the uh, uh, problems, the uh, WUS uh, problem is getting less and less. But of course, we never know everything, and it always will be an unknown uh, zone, but even worse, it's a gray zone. And you know, people in one person it can be unknown, and some person probably it's even um, something informative. So it's an important problem. And um, but you know, other thing, if you already touch this thing, it's uh, incidental findings, and the ethicists are raising a real huge problem. You know, this uh, incidental findings. Being a doctor, you know, if you did a X-ray or your arm because it was broken or uh, clavicular and found a TBC or cancer in lungs. This was incidental findings and there's absolutely no problem, you know, just report and start treatment. Now if you find the incidental findings in your genome, you know, hell of uh, uh, screams coming out at what to do and uh, we shouldn't really report and, you know, it's just uh, crazy. Uh, back to basic, you know, if you find something from patient and you can do something, do. Okay. Yeah, Jan. This is really a fascinating project and a, and a great vision. I was just wondering when, when, when you look at the other sites. I don't know much enough about the the healthcare system in Estonia, but if you take Germany for example, with that in place, I would never be able to get private insurance because they would look at the data and say, okay, this guy has 20% risk for blood pressure, 20% for that. So he needs to add on this fee, this fee, this fee. It would not be payable. No insurance would take you. So in Estonia, of course, it's all uh, centralized insurance system. 13% of salary fund goes, and the uh, government is not discriminating based on genetics and citizens. And not uh, as, as good as, you know, we are said, not discriminating between uh, people on based on sex, religion, everything, and also genetics. But uh, your question, so let's start a new insurance company, because nobody is perfect, I tell you. Everybody has something. If you just tell that I don't have anything, uh, let's look on the game. And uh, I am, uh, actually, insurance companies are changing their mind. Insurance companies now don't want to pay for treatment. Exactly. They are coming to us and looks, let, let's do this genetic risk score. And do it just prevent this disease and do avoid paying afterwards. You know, cancer treatment now, 100,000 euros per year and you live nine months. All our expense. There's, we could treat uh, now many newborn screen, uh, hundreds of thousands. So basically, uh, this is old uh, thinking that the insurance companies don't like it. Insurance companies like it very much because now it's a precise. Okay, thanks indeed. I think we could uh, spend an entire conference speaking on this, but indeed, thanks for this exciting speech. And now we are going to the... Uh, to the next presentation and uh, actually I have to say that we do have two sessions later on that are supported that are endorsed by two international uh, organizations one is the European Society for Digestive Oncology and the other is the European Helicobacter and Microbiota Study Group and uh, I'm, I'm indeed happy to invite the person who has been with this group since it very start 30 years ago, Peter Mofter, and that's only his uh, second time in Riga, and now his presentation is even broader than just Helicobacter. Yeah, thank you very much. Professor Lenin.
Alea Matsis. Thank you for the nice introduction. I really enjoy to be here in Latvia. Fascinating hospitality, nice people, cold, but not too cold for me. I will report from a man who was found in the ice and I'm his countryman. So you can imagine cold is nothing for me. Uh, it was fascinating to listen to Professor Metzpalu um, and it kind of, uh, it's anachronistic to step back now 5,300 years, but from this mummy we can learn a lot. I have to first place the Ötzi, the Iceman, in the current context of our understanding of the gut microbiome. So it's the other side from the human genome, the microbial genome, and we are so-called the supraorganism because we are composed of all this genomic and proteomic material. It's interesting to understand how the coevolution happened and how modern genomics of the microbiota can be inserted into understanding lifestyle adaptations and also, of course, it may influence our direction towards a healthy life. I will kind of a movie, there is a movie now uh, on the Ötzi just recently, it's like a Hollywood movie. I don't like it, it's too, you know, too plateal for such an important um, figure in, in the history. Uh, but I will tell you something about his lifestyle, not about his love, because that's a, one of the enigmas, how he died. Uh, and then the gut microbiome and what can we learn from this? Can it be transferred? So that's Metzpalu. He has uh, talked about 23,000 human genes. But inside, and uh, mainly inside the digestive system, we have a billion of these. And uh, so the composition of all this genomic material is important. Um, of course, this is an organ. The main microbiota content is inside the digestive system. It's the so-called sixth organ. It's silent, but its metabolic activity can be compared to the liver. So there's a lot of production coming out from it. Microbiota has many components. About 90% are bacteria, and the most knowledge is on bacteria, but we have the virome, we have the mycomes, so there is, uh, we have the parasites, and even the Ötzi, you will see, has already some of these different components of the microbiota in, inside his gut. So while the host, the human genome, is not variable. We are born with a certain genomic um, pattern, but the microbiome inside is changing, and it's the variable part of our genome. So that is the part we can influence. So just to take the example of this important study, GISTA, by my Professor Leia here, you can change this inside genome and all the consequences by taking out one bacterium from the stomach, Helicobacter pylori, and you can avoid cancer in the stomach. It's becoming a preventable disease, and so you see you can modify by influencing the microbiota the outcome of a certain disease. Now, you see two evolutionary trees, the hominids on one side and the microbiota on the other side, and you can see that these trees evolved in parallel, which is very interesting because this means that um, the hominids and the gut microbiomes have over time developed together. And if we go and look to certain populations that can be identified nowadays, we can still find people who live like the man has lived in the Neolithic, in the Paleolithic, and in the modern times, of course. And depending on whether you live in some parts which are remote from civilization and, and such microbiota analysis have been performed, then you can exactly see when from the Neolithic to the Paleolithic, 
transition period, you have changes in the microbiota because lifestyle has changed. Very briefly, just a summary of all of them, there is a higher abundance of a certain bacterial um, genotypes in some parts like Clostridialis in Malawi, Burkina Faso, or Fecalibacterium in the Western population. And just take Burkina Faso of modern times as a, an example of transition. Burkina Faso people, they have a nutrition mainly of fibers, banana and so. So their microbiota composition is basically to the major part composed of the phyla firmi, uh, bacteroidetes. Whereas the people in Italy, in Florence, where you have the nice Mediterranean kitchen, which is also fat and protein rich, you see that on the contrary, it's the firmicutes as the phylotype predominance with all the subdivisions of this um, architecture that follows. Now, of course, when we look back, and now I'm moving to Ötzi, my, my, my major title of the presentation, to the Paleolithic period, then the chemical, physiological, even psychological measurements were totally different from now. And this is important because, because all these facts have an impact on the microbiota composition too. You see, there was no nocturnal light. There was darkness at that time, just as one example, not going through all the list. So in those days, for these humans, life was totally different, and this was reflected in the microbiota composition. So now let's go to Ötzi, the Iceman, the oldest mummy found in a conserved state. And we have learned some about his uh, nutrition, about his digestion, especially based on the microbiota composition, and some relevance for disease, which is, I think, very stimulating. Now, before I knew that I was giving this lecture, I consulted my good friend, the pathologist, who also wrote a nice booklet about him. We live very close in villages in the Dolomites, the northern part of Italy. We meet often, we drink wine. And so he told me all the story about this uh, Ötzi from the moment when he was discovered. And I introduce you a few of these steps. Here he was found in the Alps, which confine between Italy and Austria. This is the borderline. And uh, you can see the place where he was detected. This was a sensation because in 91, 1991, so 27 years ago, he was found exactly in this spot. And it was detected by two German tourists who were walking there. And uh, of course, they thought this is a criminal uh, finding some person who had probably been killed several years ago. And they didn't realize the, the sensational discovery they made. But once they realized, they immediately wanted a lot of money for their discovery. That was a, a, a funny story by itself. And if somebody can read, there are many, many books now in this. I can open a historic bracket. The people that, at the origin of discovery, were involved with this, they all died very quickly after. So it was also the myth that the contact with the Ötzi and some uh, relationship are dangerous. This is also important for my personal life at that time. It's now a long time ago that I was, through this friend that I've shown you, allowed to perform the gastroscopy. And that's the, the key of our findings which I'm introducing. So after he was found, the anatomist at the University of Innsbruck very quickly understood that this is not a criminal act of the last years or decades. This man is at least 4,000 years old, 
based on the uh, radioisotope, uh, the date could exactly be established, and it was 3,300 before Christ. It was when people started also to take care of agriculture, which is very important because it changed. They were not only hunters anymore, but also gatherer. And then, as I said, many books about him, mostly um, anthropologic uh, measurements and um, insinuations about life at the time. But then something happened at the political level. We have uh, the representative of the health uh, ministry here. It happened that the Ötzi found at this border was first brought to the Austrian University, Innsbruck. And now, with experts, we found that it was on our side, on the South Tyrolean side, which is Italy. Now, in order to transport this Ötzi, because everybody understood this is an attraction, and, and, and you'll get in a minute, the inside, this is so important that first they did all the political, diplomatical objections to transport, said then for the humanity this gets lost. And, and at the end, it was transported into our small country uh, with police protection. It was a huge event. I've not been there. I was in Magdeburg working with patients. But anyhow, I, I was told by, by my friend. Now, the Ötzi, this curriculum vitae, very cold, about 40 to 50 years old, 160 centimeters, weight was good. So genetically, he was um, not prone to Oh, maybe yes, but they had a lot of m movement at the time, walking <laughs> through the Alps. He had osteoarthritis. These, in fact, are the bones of him in radiographs. He had uh, intestinal parasitosis. He had arteriosclerosis. And it's clear by isotope analysis that uh, he grew in northern Italy, which I already explained to you, and was an early European farmer. The death was in spring because what was found in, in his um, digestive system was certain plant uh, poles uh, which are only present in spring. Now, the interesting thing was also here. Uh, X-ray performed in Innsbruck in 92, and uh, they didn't see something which then was discovered years later, the Pfeilspitze, so the error tip found here. And this, of course, opened all what I have introduced by saying somebody killed him from the back and so on. It's a, it's a story beyond this. And that's now Bolzan, Bolzano, um, where he's kept in this building. And uh, millions of people coming every year to see it. And what is interesting also, the cost. The cost for this patient is enormous. It's about 1.5. Uh, million euro to keep the temperature, to keep uh, exact humidity, and so on. Now, that is he. That was also when I approached him for the gastroscopy. And um, during that time, we also had some um, material from the dental side. And you see, there was already treponema denticola and porphyrimonas gingivalis. For those who are expert in this field, shows that there have been bacteria in this region which can be found also of today. The content in the terminal ileum, you see these were all plant elements. This was uh, Trichuris trichuria, so a, a parasite. Then mineral particles and so on. So the content in the intestine had been taken. Here some examples of ovula of the parasites, the helminths. So the intestinal content research started in already 20 years ago. But what is new is that I was allowed to ask the question, did, Hel did Helicobacter pylori already get established in the stomach of the Ötzi with all the possible consequences? Helicobacter pylori, for those who are not in the field, is um, detected in 83, and in 2005, the Nobel Prize was given to Warren and Marshall. So it's a, a fundamental discovery for gastroenterology. It seemed like it's the only one that can survive the acidic environment in the stomach. Now this dogma has been rejected. 
but what happens in all those who are infected, you see here the bacteria and small, they are on the surface, they cause inflammation of the gastric mucosa. So that is the fact, although now we know that beyond Helicobacter pylori, and I could show you many data, we have other gastric microbiota depending on the degree of acidic milieu in the stomach. Now what has the Helicobacter pylori um, subtyping and genome analysis brought to our knowledge in terms of migration? Here, here you can see that there are many different Helicobacter genotypes that are originally all starting from Africa and there was also a jump in Africa from human to the feline because it's Helicobacter pylori, the real source is the human stomach. So this has been maintained and with Ötzi it was confirmed. Question is, was he a microbe that was causing problems at the time of Ötzi or was it already a pathogen? It is the oldest pathogen, and there's a paper by Achtmann in 2016 that shows that the estimate of H. pylori as the oldest pathogen is that he's 100,000 years old, 60 to 100,000. For, um, for instance, mycobacterium tuberculosis is only 6,000 years old. And if we talk about bacteria that have been cultured, the only cultured bacteria started to be in 1890, just to, to tell. So with the new methodologies, it was possible to get into a deep analysis and understanding of this composition inside the digestive system. So now, here you see the stomach. This is the stomach. And already at the CT, it was possible years ago to see that it's filled. This was my endoscopy. I could not pass the throat and the esophagus because it was a string of leather. So we had to open the abdomen. And you see this with uh, NBI for the specialist. It was filled. It was filled with 400 grams of decomposed food, fat, meat, cereals. It's in the process also to be published uh, with all the individual components of this. This was the sampling at the time, and of course, we performed microscopy, genomics, proteomics, and what was very interesting was that there was not only a genotype of Helicobacter pylori that was highly virulent, CAC-A positive, VAC-A of the, with the uh, more virulent genotype, but there was also a protein detected inside the stomach, calprotectin, we use it now as an indicator of inflammatory bowel disease, which was very high. Briefly to show you this, so the samples, you see this is the Eisman sample content, this was the PCR diagnostic, which of course can be, um, you know, from a qualitative point of view, not exact, but then the metagenomic diagnostics uh, was continued and with always using the background and Helicobacter pylori was there, unambiguous. This was a big de debate with uh, 15,000 uh, reads, so this was fine. Secondly, the highest concentration was in the stomach. Helicobacter is a gastric specify or specific bacterium. And if you move down the intestinal tract, you don't find it anymore or only to a minor extent. The calprotectin shown here is always increased, this uh, inflammatory reaction. It's released by neutrophil granulocytes. And in a shotgun proteomics of the Eisman stomach content, it was shown there was high amounts of this inflammatory protein, as I said. Where did Ötzi come from? Did he always live? where all this population at the time from there. Now, based on the genotypes, we distinguish, and I just want to pay attention, HP Europe, so most of you probably here have the HP Europe. I'm not sure about us who are living in the 
Alpine South side, but anyhow, we many of them. And this HP Europe is a combination of the African type and the West Asian type. It's a recombination. Whereas the HP Asia, especially HP Asia 2, it's nowadays in the far southeast, Bangladesh and in Asia. So here, just very quickly, the genetic variations of all these um, genotypes of Helicobacter and the global distribution has been measured in several thousands of samples by molecular biologists around the world. Now, what about Helicobacter pylori? You see, the stomach, as I mentioned, of modern neurons are predominantly the recombination of the West Asian and the African. But Helicobacter in the Iceman is an HP Asia 2. So that means some of you who have, I'm not a specialist, but I learned that in the year 10,000 when the glacier time was, people from that part moved to Central Europe. So he has certainly been there and still this type of um, bacterial genotypes are in that area from the time when they moved here. So H by Europe, as I said before, we don't need to repeat this. Ötzi tells that even though in those years then from Africa and Middle East, a migration happened to Europe with HP2 um, develop, the Asian uh, strain was not pushed away. So now what is the use scientifically of all this? That's the reason why we come back to um, an un from an anachronistic to a modern and futuristic bite. It provides an idealized scenario for sample preservation and source tracking has been made in order to compare all what has been found around the world and very briefly, this is the microbiome in different parts of mummies found here in this part of the world and compared with the Tyrolean Iceman, the Ötzi, and the soldier found in the, in the Chilean, I think, uh, uh, part. You see that the Iceman has very different composition because he lived 5,300 years ago compared to this soldier. So this is just at the level of phenotypes. One point in the Iceman, there was also Clostridium perfringens, Pseudomonas veroni species, and this Pseudomonas veroni appears to be characterized by the acquisition of antibiotic resistant genes. This is fascinating. So there are already antibiotic resistant genes in that period of time. I need myself some explanation of this. The publication is recent. I hadn't a chance. They received just the material to see. And now for our friend, the vice dean of this university, who is a fantastic cardiologist, he should know that, uh, and also Metzpalu, that the Ötzi, he was a slim guy, he had um, diverse food inside, had a good um, composition, but he had Helicobacter pylori, and probably he had other inflammatory uh, prone microbiota that caused atherosclerotic disease in him. He was 40 years old, he was slim, he ate, he made everything what a modern healthy life to prevent would, would expect. So it would be extremely interesting to put him in your cohort in, in Estland. But I'm, I'm sure that the anthropo anthropologists in, in Bozen, they will take care of this. So let me just conclude this story, which was just a, for me, I, for me, the only thing I was interested in is, did he have Helicobacter or not? And so it's the oldest H. Burry strain sequence, and it confirmed many of the extrapolations before. He shows us how migration happened, that at what time, from what part of the world people where I'm from lived, and uh, of course, diet has been interesting, and once this data get published, we will see how the relationship is in more detail between the diet and the microbiota composition that will be extended. So I hope it is kind of a nice story for you and for the young people, a stimulation on how to proceed 
microbiota, human genome, the composition, and all lifestyle factors together. The ancient guy already showed us some of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great overview about a fascinating topic. So, any questions from the audience? I was very sad that you spared the love story of the Otzi. Um, so, you showed that the microbiome composition was different from what we see nowadays, yeah. right? But he already had kind of the modern world, Western lifestyle diseases. So, is that what we start to understand now, the association of microbiome with these diseases, is that no. maybe a bit overrated? No, the fact is that he has microbiota like Helicobacter pylori that is also present today. And we know that Helicobacter is a, a pro-inflammatory bacterium, so he had that. And probably, and that analysis has not yet been performed, besides Helicobacter pylori, of, which, of whom we know that it raises also the C-reactive protein in blood. If at, at minimal levels. And if he had more of this pro-inflammatory microbiota, which we don't know, but we know nowadays that there are certain, or, and certainly he did not have, for instance, Ackermansia mucinifila, which is something that you increase by running and it is protective against uh, coronary heart disease. So it's, it's, a, it's a field uh, in evolution, but he had many microbiota, what we already know, that are still present today. Any further questions? Yes. I was wondering, uh, what about the health complications? Did you actually see any of those in, 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 in the body, actually? I mean, yeah, like, I don't know. And please, first of all, thank you that you come here today. I, I learned all your molecular research, uh, David. Um, so the main focus and the best studied part up to now is the content of the food, which I cannot tell because it's not yet in, 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 in public domain. Uh, and the um, helicobacter was there in the content, but there was no mucosa anymore because the mucosa had gone. That was the big, but to tell that there was an inflammatory reaction, we base this assumption on the high release that still is found of calprotectin inside this material that we gain. But of course, I also, before we started, we thought we find also mucosa to see is there pre-neoplastic, neoplastic, that's all gone, unfortunately. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, once again, thank you for a great presentation. and. <laughs> Since we are a bit running short of time, it's my pleasure to introduce Uga Dumpis from the university here, the University of Latvia, who will give an overview about the very pressing and imminent topic of antibiotic resistance. Uh, sorry, I... Yeah. Oh, okay. So, it's an honor to be here and present our work we have been doing over the past 15 years. And uh, antimicrobial resistance is a complicated issue affecting not only humans but also animals and environment. To understand the ecology of this uh, problem you have to use one health approach. The human part is only small part of the uh, uh, of the ecosystem, and hospitals are even smaller part. At the same time, it is uh, very important to understand that the resistance at the moment is actually a major problem in healthcare associated infections, not the community acquired infections. So the hospital issue is very relevant at the moment to understand the spread of, uh, of resistance in hospitals would help us to understand the spread uh, around the hospitals. So we have to understand and define the problem. We have to plan intervention based on our observations and data. We have to intervene 
we have to assess our interventions and we have to publish our experience even if it's negative or failed. And uh, uh, so we started early in 2001 and we did a point prevalence study which is a very simple approach going into hospital unit in one day collect all the patient demographics and see how many patients have received an antibiotic. And if they received an antibiotic, we wanted to know why did they receive an antibiotic, whether that was a community-acquired infection or healthcare-acquired infection. So we did study in two hospitals, and then we did study in all the Latvia and we managed to publish it in, in a decent uh, international journal, Eurosurveillance. So it was an easy kind of protocol, but with some relevance to others. And we were not the only ones who did this uh, type of approach. And also, there was uh, studies in there were studies in Scotland, in Sweden, and in Belgium. All these protocols resulted in a common protocol for, uh, for pan-European countries uh, study on point prevalence survey. And uh, that was a groundbreaking survey because that was organized by ECDC and that really collected data from all, the, uh, all European countries. And we learned during that study that six patients out of 100 patients have healthcare associated infections. We know that most of them had pneumonia, surgical site infection, and urinary tract infections. And we know the main pathogens were E. coli, Staph aureus, but we saw other pathogens. More than half of these pathogens were associated with anti-multidrug resistance. So this study uh, really uh, uh, gave a way for political approach to resistance in Europe. There are other types of work that can be done. Resistant bacteria uh, cause outbreaks. And outbreak investigation is essential to understand the spread of bacteria. This was the first Klebsiella pneumonia strain, ESBL positive, that was imported from German intensive care unit to our neurology department. And you can see how easily this is the one strain. The method is called pulse field gel electrophoresis. And we saw the same strain of bacteria in surgical unit, intensive care, transplant unit, urology, and this strain of bacteria is still in our hospital. So we didn't manage to contain it. That was 2010. Another bacteria, carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumannii, is a major problem in our intensive care units. In this study, together with Latvian Biomedical Center, we did the full genome sequencing uh, for phylogenetic analysis. And you see two outbreaks, uh, two, two clusters of uh, multidrug resistant bacteria, one from neonatal uh, IC intensive care unit and one, one from general intensive care unit. So full genome sequencing really helps to distinguish different strains in the hospital. Uh, actually, the neonatal uh, outbreak was contained. Then interventions. We participated in uh, inter several intervention studies, multicenter intervention studies uh, with our intensive care unit. This study, Mossar study, was published in Lancet Infectious Diseases in 2014, where we looked at the impact of intervention on transmission of multidrug resistant bacteria in ICU. And we looked, our target microorganisms were gram positive MRSA and VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococci, 
and ESBL producing gram-negative bacteria, gram -negative bacteria. What we employed at that time very novel uh, uh, screening method, uh, PCR screening, rapid screening method, uh, gene expert uh, method. We tried to improve hand hygiene and we washed every patient with chlorhexidine solution in order to block the transmission uh, from patient to patient. So that was a, a multi-center study in 16 intensive care units in Europe. So you see the compliance with the hand hygiene. We started really very low and achieved rather good data. Uh, nevertheless, study didn't meet our expectations. You see, it's a complicated slide, but this is the rate of colonization in ICUs of all bacteria, target bacteria. So there was no change. There was improvement with MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, but that was already known before that screening hand hygiene works for MRSA. So the study didn't really give us more information. Now we know that probably study wasn't successful because we addressed only one part of the containment strategy, which is infection control. We know now that we have to also improve our use of antibiotics. It's called antimicrobial stewardship. So uh, if we would be clever now to design that study, we would use antibiotic stewardship measures as well. Another study was a prohibit study published this year in intensive care unit, uh, intensive care medicine. We tried to reduce central venous catheter related bloodstream infections through hand hygiene campaign, strict insertion, the central venous catheter insertion protocol and combination of hand hygiene and new insertion protocol. So here you see that combination of increased hand hygiene measures and new insertion uh, protocol worked much better than only hand hygiene only and insertion protocol only. So we have to improve hand hygiene and we have to uh, uh, do this, uh, uh, also uh, insert devices properly. So we looked uh, at our, our data separately in another paper from this study because, uh, and here you see the infection rates uh, before and after the intervention in our intensive care unit. And you see the majority of infections occur later than 10 days after insertion. That means that it's not insertion itself that caused infection, but the care of catheters. So we have to be careful with catheters after they are inserted. And we, if you look at our hand hygiene rates, they were lower than I showed before the average rates. So they are quite low. We achieved 56% compliance with hand hygiene, which shows, again, the worst performance in care of the catheters. So why did that happen? We designed an anthropological study with anthrop human anthropologists going into intensive care unit for three months, joining intensive care work, non-medical person. And she did observations and re interviewed the people. And it turned out in this study that uh, it's the refusal not to d d disinfect hands was not due to the lack of information or time. And it was more about the environment, psychological environment in the department that, uh, uh, so that it caused the conscious resistance strategy. And the programs that tried to minimize power struggles and aiming to increase staff job satisfaction, self-respect and well-being should be considered. So it's not only about big genetic research, it's about human behavior. So we have to know more about the places we work and we do our interventions. So 
this year, we are starting a multi-center uh, study uh, sponsored by European Commission, uh, including Karolinska Institute, uh, coordinated by University of Cologne, there were uh, six in Norway, Canada, Israel also are trying, we will be looking at all the factors at the same time to see how infection control in impacts, and the study is called Pilgrim, impacts colonization, how our antimicrobial stewardship would prevent coloniza colonization with resistant bacteria to become dominant, and uh, later we will look at the infection uh, rates 30 days after discharge. And we will also use anthropological design interviews of the antibiotic prescribing physicians, how they behave and what is their motivation. So uh, quite a complicated and challenging study so conclusions, hospitals are very difficult environments to study. Resistance problem is relatively new. We don't know everything. So we, we think we know a lot, but we still don't know the detail. And not every intervention works as expected. So we need a complex approach, including behavioral research. And there are a lot of country-specific circumstances. So there are a lot of things to study in Latvia, Estonia, and Germany, and they might be different. Thank you very much for <laughs> those who, I'm sorry we are over the time. <laughs> <laughs> Want to, yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Dumpis. It's always fascinating to hear what is your research activity and the scope of international collaboration. So, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, there's one. Can you? Yes, thank you, Mr. Professor, uh, for your presentation. Um, you mentioned in your speech that there are several ways we can try to control the spread of pathogens in the hospital units. Uh, you mentioned hand hygiene and uh, ways we introduce different uh, things in like catheters, etc. And then you mentioned that we have to think or rethink the ways we use antibiotics. And I was wondering whether you could expand a little bit on that. <laughs> okay, that's a long story. But we know that we use uh, at least 30% more antibiotics in hospitals that we should be using. So 30% is a kind of careful estimate. And we know that we are using, uh, in half of the patients, wrong dosage or wrong antibiotic or too wide spectrum antibiotics. So there's a major place for improvement. So that's uh, studies from our hospitals, but uh, Latvia is not the worst for antibiotic use. So it could be more difficult and so. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things to do in antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals. All right, thank you. I understand we could expand even much more on that, but unfortunately we are really very restricted in terms of time. So thank you very much. And now uh, by this I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much for all the speakers, all the audience. And uh, finally, uh, just by taking this opportunity, I would like to say very special thanks uh, to one of our colleagues, Danute Rajoka uh, Ebela, but I'm afraid I cannot see her, but uh, I would like just to point out that she has uh, done a tremendous work and also with a team who really helped <clears throat> to do all the technical part and the organizational part of this uh, conference, which I believe is, uh, will be and is already a success. Thank you very much and let's proceed to the sessions.
Šitas no šitā iet. Yeah. So, we should... Uh,